Okay, I think I'm just going to get started here and hopefully some people come during my introduction slides. Um, welcome to the Airbrake Critical Design Review, or as we like to call it, the ABCDR. Um, for Boosted Bear, the next generation, I'm Sierra Stockwell, the president of Mass of Dearborn, and we'll start you off. So today our presentation will be a lot shorter than usual. Um, we're going to start with project overview for about 10 minutes, then we'll move into the mechanical section of the air brakes for 20 minutes. We'll have a brief intermission for five minutes, then we'll move into the electrical portion for 10 minutes, then risk analysis for both mechanical and electrical for another 10 minutes, project management for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into questions. So each year we compete in Spaceport America Cup which is usually in New Mexico, but this year will be held online over a few days. Um, we compete in the 10K COTS category. So we purchase our motor and we fly to a 10,000 foot Apogee. Um, since there will be downtime before we can manufacture and purchase, the team will begin a research and design education phase towards a 30K commercial off the shelf rocket next year. Okay, so we still haven't gotten any updates on the Spaceport America Cup point breakdown for this year. Um, this is what it's been in the past, but since we are going online and we won't be required to fly a rocket for points or submit any, you know, physical pieces of our design, we're not sure how we'll be graded in these two big categories for design implementation and scoring flight performance, but we do know we will be graded mostly on our technical report, which we have prepared for a lot this year. We've been practicing almost monthly, um, reviewing that and updating it as we needed to. We will get the entry form and progress updates points because that's pass or fail, and we've submitted all of those and plan to submit the last one. And we're not sure if there will be any bonus points available. So this score is kind of arbitrary at the moment. Here are competition milestones. On December 11th, we had our first progress report. March 3rd, we had our electrical critical design review. March 5th, we had our second progress report for competition due. March 24th, we had our mechanical critical design review. And today, April 15th, we're having our air brake critical design review. Um, we also will have to purchase tickets just for an online version of competition on April 19th, which we've been approved for. Um, May 14th, our third progress report will be due along with our technical report, any poster session materials, which are going to be a little bit different this year, podium session materials, and I don't think we need a school particip participation letter or waiver this year, but we'll see. And then June 18th through the 20th will be our online competition. Here's our leadership structure. I am the team lead, Sierra Stockwell. Alia Sablini is our mechanical lead and Justin Kissel is our electrical lead. You'll be hearing from both of them today. Here's our team member breakdown. As you can see, we've retained 21 members from a previous competition year. We have 31 members total. 18 of those are men, 12 of them are women. So we have gained 10 new members and we are almost even on men and women. And you can see here what everybody's major and class is. So the team goals for this year have changed a little bit since competition will be online instead of in person. One of our major goals is to submit an extensive technical report to competition since that is the only way we'll really be graded this year. Um, and then we also plan to launch in the summer or fall locally since we don't currently have access to measles and we don't have to launch at competition. In, if we do launch in the fall, we would like to include new members so they can see how the launch process works. We would like to retain 10 or more new members this year, place top 15th overall, and get two to four members L1 certified, which we do have one member actually trying for L1 certification on Saturday. So we'll see how that works. And if he does get that certification, he plans to go to L2 as well. Here's our vehicle architecture. We fly in a boosted dart configuration. 
So our booster leads us up until motor burnout, and then it goes to its own shorter apogee as the dart goes to our target apogee. At the top here, you see that we have our telegps connected to our new member payload, which adheres to the von Karman geometry, so it is up in the nose cone a bit. And then we have our camera shrouds, which are there to um, basically protect the rocket from the holes that the cameras have and to reduce drag from the cameras that stick out of our payload. Then in the bottom of the new member payload, we have our DNA and enzyme experiment. And we have a copper foil antenna below our payload to make sure that it's not in the middle of a lot of metal. And then we have our dart parachute, which will be a reefed parachute this year, which is why we don't have two parachutes in the dart. This is our dart eBay, which is a part of our flight package, which holds all the electronics for our recovery systems, our air brakes, which are above our deployable fins. This is our booster main parachute at the top of the booster. And then we have our booster recovery eBay in between the booster main parachute and the drogue mortar tube, which holds our drogue parachute in the booster. Our motor is at the bottom along with our static fins. Here's our launch vehicle summary. So the rocket length is 11 feet 4 inches. The weight with the motor is 59 pounds. The weight without is 41 pounds. Our motor choice is the Cesaroni M795. And our first recovery system are the MissileWorks RRC2 altimeters, which are for our booster parachute. And for our DART parachute, we have MissileWorks RRC3 Plus altimeters. Here's a summary of our payload. This year, we're collecting data on DNA and enzymes to see how they denature during launch. This is especially relevant since space travel is becoming more and more common in a tourist attraction sort of way. And potentially, you know, as people go to Mars, an even bigger way. Um, we would like to know if flight will lead to DNA denaturing or mutations, and if flight will render cells unable to protect themselves from dangerous compounds. Here's our concept of operations. At 1A, you can see our launch at zero seconds and zero feet. At 2A, you see motor burnout at 12.7 seconds and 7,000 feet. 1B, booster separates at 14 seconds and 8,000 feet. At 2B, both the booster reaches its apogee and the drogue parachute deploys at 23 seconds and 9,200 feet. At 3B, the booster main parachute deploys at 72 seconds and 1,500 feet. And then at 4B, the booster lands at 85 seconds. At 1C, our air brakes deploy in 14 seconds at 8,068.2 feet. Then at 2C, our dart reaches its apogee and the parachute deploys at 22 seconds and 10,100 feet. And at 3C, the reef is cut, so basically the main parachute deploys at 68 seconds at 1,500 feet, and then the dart lands at 76 seconds. Now for the mechanical and electrical team overview with Alia and Justin. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Kissel. Uh, I'm the electrical lead this year, and uh, Alia Sublini is our mechanical lead. Uh, we've just got a few introduction slides before we get into the technical stuff about the air brakes. Uh, so we'll go over our team structures, our full system diagrams, uh, the current standing for both the teams, uh, and our overall timelines, as well as just an overview of how the presentation is going to work. Next slide. So we're going to start off with the, by the way, hi, I'm Alia Splini, <laughs> mechanical lead, and we're going to start off with the team structure. So at the top, it's got me as mechanical lead, and then we have the sub teams of airframe and propulsion led by Sarah Dormo with the members Barnabas Toth, Meribeth Mon, Andre Shotko, and uh, Alexander Zakar. Then we've got recovery led by Alexander Burkhart with the members of Easton Carcer, uh, Carson Easter, sorry, <laughs> and Alexander Lazaros. Then we have our payload lead, uh, Devin Nimmer with the uh, Devin Nimer with uh, biological payload lead Alexis Warchok and uh, but mechanical payload lead Logan Kilby. And we've got Shivani Patel and Lilia Bykirk as the general members for biological, and then Dagan Marshall as the general member for payload mechanical. Next slide, please. 
So this is a project breakdown by members. You can look through it if you want, but today we're focusing on the air brakes. The project is being led by me and then the members that are working on it that have worked on it is uh, Meribeth Mon, Sarah Dormel, Barnabas Toth, Alex Alexandra Lazaros, Andre Storko, as well as Sierra Stack while she's in there too. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we have the system engineering for the upper dart, and we'll start with the G G tele-GPS at the top of the payload. Um, it's there to avoid interference. And then we have the ballast, uh, then we have the camera shrouds to protect and ensure that the cameras minimally disrupt the airflow. And then we have the frame A, B, and the biological payload to screw together for ease of integration. Then we have the payload, uh, which has a key feature to ensure alignment with the airframe for the cameras. Then we've got the copper foil antenna, which is placed below the payload and between two fiberglass bulk bulkheads to mitigate interference. Then we have the shock cords that retain the parachutes and the flight pack and it the flight package ejects upon parachute deployment. Then we also have the ballast right beneath uh, the tele-GPS to give the rocket more stability. Next slide, please. Now we have the system engineering for the flight package. There are three eye bolts for the recovery, uh, for recovery at the top to retain the flight package into the uh, sustainer. And then we have the um, uh, DAB, which holds the recovery electronics for the dart parachute. Then we have the air brakes, which have an alignment feature to ensure ease of integration. And then we have the deployable fin system, in, which is compressed in the flight package using uh, threaded rods to ensure that the T-supports are engaged. And then we have the uh, air brakes electronics mount that holds the air brake controller and its power supply. Next slide, please. Then we have the shock cords that will retain to that bulkhead right there. And that will retain the parachute to that bulkhead right there. And then we have the mortar tube that separates the drogue from the main parachute to ensure that they don't deploy at the same time. And then we've got the static fins, which are mounted within the slots in the airframe. And then we have the thrust plate, which disperses the loads from the motor. Now, the mass distribution for the rocket goes as this. Our total rocket is 56.3 pounds, but the uh, upper dart is 26% of that weight, the lower dart is 7% of that weight, the flight pack is 15%, the lower booster is 11%, the upper booster is 8%, and the motor is 33% of that weight. Next slide, please. So for our overall mechanical timeline, we started in June, uh, we started design season in June, and we ended in eight, on April 10th. Um, and we started analysis on October 20th, and we're ending analysis on May 15th. So then we have the um, manufacturing, which is going to start on June 17th and August, and then end on August 17th. And then hopefully integration will start on August 18th and end September 1st, and we'll launch sometime in September. Next slide, please. All right, and now I'll go over the electrical team structure. Uh, like I said before, I'm the electrical lead. Our three main teams are RF, or radio frequency, power, and data. Uh, the part that we're concerned with here today, uh, the people working on the air brakes. Uh, our data lead, Joshua Hawkins, has been the uh, driving force behind the air brake motor controller, and he did all the physical design there. And then uh, the central data sub team to the below and left of Josh, uh, we have Lucas as our lead, and then Eric Salinas and Batul Salmasi. Uh, they've been working on the software, uh, including the control loop for the air brakes, which they'll present later. Next slide. Our project breakdown by members. Uh, we've got the relevant sub teams bolded. Uh, so we've got two projects the ABC on the bottom, the air brake motor controller with Josh Hawkins, and the data logging system uh, led by Lucas Ringe working with Batul. Next slide. Here's our system engineering. If you go one more forward, we can look at the relevant part of this diagram. Uh, you'll see that the ABC is one of our peripheral boards. Uh, it's not in the main flight computer. It's connected wirelessly through the antenna that goes to the M2RB that you see there. Uh, and that gets its data from the Ethernet switch and ultimately from the AC-DC, uh, where all the processing is going to be done and sent over to the air brakes for actuation. Next slide. Here's our flight computer current budget. If you go forward twice, we can get our two circles. Uh, we can see our real usage on the bottom, same as it's been for the last couple of design reviews. We're pleased with that, and we're also pleased with our data, our battery life, rather, of 3.3 hours. We think this will be plenty. Next slide. Here's the overall electrical timeline. Uh, right now it's April 15th, so we're in this research phase. Uh, hopefully we're, we're hoping to purchase, you know, at the end of this semester, uh, but we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, but primarily right now, what we're doing is we are continuing working on uh, this year's systems, so things for the air brakes primarily. And then we are doing lots of research for the 30K rocket. Uh, and then that will stretch until the end of August and hopefully with our launch uh, sometime in the fall. Next slide. And then here's our current air brake standing. So mechanically, we have all of our CAD, CAM, and initial analysis complete. Uh, so next we're going to do our in-depth analysis, uh, hopefully purchasing when the university allows, and prototyping. This will also depend on the university. And then electrically, uh, the air brake motor controller is fully designed, and it has been for a while now. Uh, like I said before, we're just waiting for purchasing. Uh, however, a new concern has come up. There's a bit of a global silicon shortage, uh, so hopefully that we can get a purchasing back pretty soon so that we can uh, avoid this as much as possible. Uh, and then software, uh, we'll be able to continue this more once all the hardware has been manufactured. Uh, we'd just like the boards to do more in-depth software, but we'll go over everything that we have today. Uh, Lucas Ringe will go over that later. Next slide. Uh, the presentation overview, uh, similar to all of our other design reviews, we have our risk analysis at the end. And then in the bottom left corner, uh, we can find each section in the report. I believe that Sierra attached those to your uh, invitation email. They are labeled mechanical and electrical, respectively. Next slide. All right, welcome. This is air brake mechanical portion. Um, I will be presenting Adi Sablini. Uh, so will Meribeth Mon, Barnabas Toth, and Sierra Sockwell. And you can find this uh, this portion of the air brakes in section 2.3 of the mechanical report. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with the purpose. Um, if you look to your right, you can see that that's where the air brakes are located on the full rocket. So the air brakes will be allowing for precise altitude control through real-time deployment of drag inducers. The blades will either extend or contract to affect the acceleration and thus the final aperture. And when the central motor spins, it's going to move the three blades perpendicular to the airframe. And this system is controlled by the EBC and the air brakes physically interface with the flight package. Next slide, please. So here's the design breakdown. If you look to the right, you can see that the um, it's composed of two separate plates with uh, electronics mount on top, and then the three blades are all connected with um, a, with a rotary plate, essentially. So the air brakes are self, uh, assembled as self-contained subsystem, and they can be easily integrated. The two bulkheads will be containing the motile components and are assembled as one and loaded into the flight package altogether like slid down the three threaded rods. And then the three, uh, 3D, print, uh, 3D printed mount will rest on top for the uh, ABC and battery control, and that will be bolted down with nuts onto the threaded rods. And then there is also a slot in the upper bulkhead for the limit switch. And then the motor will be directly mounted onto the plate. For a full integration, you can find that in section 2.34 of the mechanical report. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the electronics mount for the air brakes. It is a mount to accommodate the air brake controller and the battery supply. It is created as a triangular frame to allow these spaces on the sides of the triangle to hold the battery and the ABC. The first side holds the controller and the second side holds the battery. The three mounting tubes in the corners are made to fit over the threaded rods in the flight package. And the third additional side is added for a mount to have more rigidity and then additional material around the mounting holes for also increased rigidity in mounting it over the threaded rods. So if you look right here, um, this is the a CAD drawing of the um, top bulkhead. Um, so we did a tolerance analysis on it and therefore there should be no issues with assembly and the results of analysis can be observed right there. It says 2.1 and this is actually an RC6 uh, running fit. So next slide, we'll show you the um, bottom bulkhead has the same fit along the slot where it interfaces with the blades. So both the top and bottom bulkhead have it as well as the blades have this tolerancing. Um, and it's supposed to be a medium running fit and it's meant to be manufactured on the CNC mill. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so we did a complete CFD analysis and um, the reason for that was uh, to establish that the stabilizing effects of the deployable fins are not jeopardized. 
um, by the, the wakes uh, from uh, pressure and velocity. And we, would also, we also did it to generate a drag force lookup table for the control system. Um, and the simulation we considered uh, was um, a compressible uh, turbulent airflow uh, with no heat transfer to the rocket. And uh, uh, we did a, a boundary condition to the uh, rocket where uh, the rocket surface was simulated as a 60 micrometers in, in roughness, uh, which was the um, which is standard paint uh, roughness in the open rocket. Um, all right, uh, the simulation runs that we ran were limited by computational power, and we plan to repeat it with a finer mesh. We ach achieved um, a very good mesh convergence, but not uh, so there could still be a slight improvement with increase with um, you know, uh, finer meshes. So we plan to gain access to a server to run those uh, uh, simulations. Next slide, please. All right, um, so the analysis done in COMSOL, that's what software we used, showed no or minimal decrease of pressure around the wings in both low and high velocities. Here you can see uh, two pictures of uh, uh, the um, velocity distribution around the rocket. Um, and um, the lookup table we generated was uh, done with the following strategy. We would pick a weather condition um, for our launch site. Uh, that, was, that was common, that was the research by Sarah Dormal. Uh, we would establish uh, a velocity altitude curve for the DART with MATLAB and open rocket without, without the uh, air brakes deployed. Um, we, would pick an altitude and uh, we would pick altitude and velocity combinations under this curve uh, and simulate drag forces with different air brake deployments. Uh, for, uh, and uh, we would also simulate extra points for redundancy. Um, and uh, we would solve for missing values using uh, the drag force equation and curve fitting. And there, I will talk more about that later. And at the end, we would pick a new uh, weather condition. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so here you can see uh, this is the simulation of pressure around the deployable fins. Uh, so you can um, uh, see that uh, the pressure wakes left by the air brakes had no effect on the deployable fins. You can see that. Um, uh the pressure uh they like right be behind the um uh air brakes don't, don't doesn't ever reach uh the deployable fins uh it doesn't ever even ever reach that their um their plane uh but um yeah all right next slide please Right. Um, so um, this is the strategy we used for uh, finding missing values uh, because we could interpolate it, but we found that this was a better uh, approach. Um, so um, we would assume that the drag force uh, coefficient equals the drag force coefficient times the area, and we would generate curve fits for different values uh, uh, of um, uh, temperature, pressure, uh, which are of function of altitude. Um, for different values, assuming uh, drag, uh, the drag coefficient is independent of the other factors, and we would uh, uh, update the data as it became available, um, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so on the um, uh, uh, bottom right, uh, you can see uh, this is essentially the data we are getting. So um, let's pick a uh, air brake deployment, and let's pick an altitude. Um, and at that altitude, we know the pressure and temperature, um, and that, that lets us calculate everything else. Uh, we would simulate regular velocity, which was given by open rocket, and we would add um, other points, so plus 20%, negative, uh, minus 20%, and so on, and we would uh, get those drag forces. Um, yep, uh, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, on the left uh, another illustration of the data. This is plotted differently. This is the um, uh, drag forces we get with uh, different um, uh, air brake deployments. We have found that um, with the uh, air brake uh, deployment variation, we can get a 300 feet uh, apogee variation. And uh, on the right, you can see additional uh, uh, pressure and velocity profile illustrations. These are at lower velocities. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the cam that was done for the air brake bottom bulkhead. The machine time should be around an hour and three minutes on the CNC mill. We will have five operations. We'll have two drill bits, two end mills, notes for manufacturing. Material will need to be cut and face to size on the manual mill before using the CNC mill. 
the counterbore and key feature will need to be done on the manual mill since they are on the opposite side of these slots that need to be toleranced very well. Um, and tabs are included on the final contour of this piece. You can't really see it in this um, view, but that just makes sure that the part is kept parallel and one side doesn't fall while we are at the finishing pass. And then we'll just dremel those edges down once they are done. And then here's the top bulkhead cam. It is a similar runtime one hour and 10 minutes. We have six operations, three drill bits, two end mills, and the notes are the same as the previous. So for testing, we're going to have uh, a polymer ABC mount that we're going to uh, validate for fit, finish, and rigidity requirements. Um, it should be within the plan tolerances and, and within the expected axle loads, and that should be completed by May 5th. And then we will be having reliability tests for the air brakes once they're manufactured. And the blades, uh, so the reliability tests will be under certain temperatures, certain different, like certain conditions, you know, like cleanliness, like there's dirt, right? And then the blades should still rapidly deploy with minimal interference, and that should be accomplished by June 16th. Next slide, please. Okay, we will now take a brief intermission and we will be back in five minutes, so feel free to stretch, use the restroom, what have you, and then we should take about 30 minutes for the rest of the presentation.
Okay, our intermission is now over, and we will start with the electrical part of the air brakes. All right, so I'm Lucas, and I will be talking about the uh, control systems for the air brakes. Next slide. So um, as similar to what Mechanical was saying, the purpose of the air brakes is to control uh, the apogee during the ascent of the rocket. So we want to control um, our final apogee so we can get closer to our predicted, oh, well, our pre um, desired apogee mid-flight. Um, we're going to use sensor data that we have available on the rocket, such as an IMU, um, other positional data, and a reference between um, a GPS that's on board to determine the parameters for our control system. And overall, we hope this will help us improve our scoring at the competition if we actually got to fly. Uh, but we'll be testing the system since we don't get to actually fly a competition to make sure when we do get to fly later on, we have a working system. Next slide. So here is a very, very, very early prototype model. This is the only complete prototype model that we have right now. Uh, currently, we're working on a discrete model. However, that's not in a good enough stage to have a complete showcase of what we're thinking. So this is the continuous model we designed where we had a lot of lessons learned that we're applying to our discrete model, which we'll go over in a bit. Next slide. So the main concept or idea behind our control loop is we're going to be um, operating on a PID loop system. Um, specifically, we're going to implement gauge scheduling into that system so we can have a more um, nonlinear control over our uh, system. Um, for terms of the air input to our PID system, we're going to just subtract our current predicted apogee minus our desired apogee, and we can use that as our air function, as well as we're going to do some filtering on our inputs and outputs just to make sure we don't have any rapid jitters or deployments. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be using gain scheduling, um, and we'll be talking about more how we plan on getting the values for that soon, as well as um, our nonlinear parameters, because this is a nonlinear system, will be done using simulations, such as the uh, air brake drag force to control our apogee, as well as our apogee prediction um, and the uh, uh, force. Those will also be done and implemented more than likely using lookup tables in our code. Next slide. So apogee prediction. Um, our current model for apogee prediction relies on the vertical velocity of the rocket, our orientation of our rocket, as well as the altitude of the rocket. Um, reason being is we need to know what the orientation is so we can know what our drag force vector would be so we know where our force is coming from, as well as we need to know our velocity so we know how it would adjust our, um, how we can adjust that to get to our desired apogee. Um, so in our system as a whole, we input our velocity orientation and the current drag force that we have from our air brakes or from our rocket in general. And then we would output a height, which would be our change in height from our current uh, altitude, which we can get from a lookup table, which we will simulate over before and we'll have those used in a lookup table. Um, the G prediction will be utilizing those nonlinear uh, parameters I mentioned earlier, such as the drag force, which we can uh, get from the CFD simulations that you saw in the mechanical section. And then we will also be, as they mentioned, using uh, interpolation between those points so we can reduce the simulations and still get a relatively accurate model. Next slide. So implementation of our lookup tables. Um, pretty straightforward implementation. Uh, we have in this case, we have an image where we have an example. We have two inputs. Um, the K would be our force, and the V0 is our vertical velocity. We just have a known step size in our lookup table beforehand. We convert a floating point or uh, double type data type into an integer type, which we can then plug into an index of our lookup table, and we get a change in height out. Um, the reason we're using lookup tables is we have, we're using a Raspberry Pi, and for some situations, it may not make sense for a high cycle rate to use or calculate the data on the fly. And then in the case of the CFD numbers, it would be impossible to calculate even one CFD number during the entire flight of the rocket. So we will use a lookup table. And since our system has a lot of RAM and a lot of data storage, comparatively speaking, we should have no issue uh, storing and running these lookup tables. Next slide. So air function generation. So on the right, you can see we have two graphs. The top one is the example air function that we got from an early simulation. And then we have the smooth version below. Um, the reason for smoothing, as, uh, as I said earlier, to reduce sharp edges or high frequency jitters, we would like to reduce those if there's any 
high frequency noise or jitters on our output, we might see oscillations in our air brakes, or we might have rapid deployments that aren't possible for our air brakes to perform or may cause a significant change that may be detrimental to the rocket. So we will avoid those with the filtering when possible. Next slide. So the PID loop will be implemented, as I said, with gain scheduling for its parameters. Uh, the output of the low pass of the PID loop will also be low pass filtered, similar to the air filter. It'll probably be the same cutoff frequency designed as well. Um, currently, the tuning will be done manually. Um, I'll get more to the tuning when we get to the gain scheduling, since we're going to be tuning based on those parameters. Next slide. So gain scheduling. Um, the reason for using gain scheduling is, as I said earlier, the system is highly nonlinear. So we want to be able to account for the nonlinearity as well as it allow us to tune our variables to allow for a slower breaking at the start of the loop as well as for a higher breaking at the end of the loop. It'll help us implement that so we don't over break and we'll end up in a situation where we can correct for our mistakes later on rather than having to be too low early on. Um, the values for the gain scheduling will be found by <clears throat> solving for set points in our altitude range. So we'll set a known value, let's say an increment that we know, and then we'll run Monte Carlo simulations on these points. Um, and we'll be able to find what the ideal point would be at these sections. The Monte Carlo simulations will be integrated with a MATLAB simulation that we're using of a rocket, which we can get from, we should be able to simulate the DART's ascent path. And we'll be using that to adjust and calculate and do our Monte Carlo simulations. And all of that will be done using MATLAB and Simulink. Next slide. So system delays, uh, with any control loop, we have to make sure we're aware of our delays. Um, as you can see on the image on the right, if we would not have a good knowledge of our delays or we have wrong delays estimated, we might get some oscillations in our system. That said, we do have several sources that will cause delays. Um, our lookup tables would have memory reads, which we don't, which we minor, but we have larger um, delays, let's say, as a signal propagation between, um, or the RF transmission between our air brakes and our calculating board, the Raspberry Pi, also the transmission between our internal networks. And then we also have to worry about the air brake physically deploying to that position. And that is another delay. All these delays are going to be either calculated or measured. And as a result, we hope to be able to model these relatively accurately so that we don't have any major issues down the line when we're running a system, as well as if we have wrong delays, if we're moving very fast, we may have inaccuracies as we might move 40 to 50 feet off our point that we're actually thinking we're at. Next slide. So some of the decisions we made in the development of the system, um, as I said with the earlier prototype model, we designed the first model as a continuous system. This was mostly as a exercise in learning how to get a system like this to work. Um, the results of that are going to be used in the implementation of a final discrete model. Uh, the discrete model being what we're gonna implement as our final air brake because it's ability to be run on the CPU more efficiently and just in being possible to run on it in a way that makes sense. Um, we can convert directly between these two models if we wanted to using a tool in Simulink. However, we're just going to restart the design and use the lessons learned to make a more um, thought out and better designed system in the total. Next slide. So here's a rough timeline of what we have currently done. Um, currently, we're finishing up the nonlinear parameter generation aspect and the discrete uh, model will begin a full design process soon. Um, this was work done, but the full work will be start once the numbers are given to us. Um, and then we'll go through, and as we're designing, we're going to be testing in series and at the same time, and we hope to get everything done around July, August uh, the at the very latest. And we also plan on testing everything in an integrated simulation. You'll hear more about that shortly. Next slide. So the tests we plan on running, um, we just want to test our model, such as the gain scheduling delays, our error function, and all that makes sense. Um, that's going to be done just in the model itself. We can feed in fake data or we can feed in uh, uh, ideal data just to make sure we get reasonable results. Uh, and then we would have simulation tests where we use our the MATLAB model I mentioned earlier, where we can do the DART's uh, trajectory. Um, we can use that to tune as well as verify that our model makes sense and does work relatively well. And then from there, we want to do an integrated simulation where everything is running on the hardware it's supposed to run on and we read actual or 
we read data from sensors that is predetermined, but it still goes through the same delays of our system. So we can verify that the system architecture and the whole system as a whole can perform adequately to the simulation we ran earlier. Next slide. Hello, I'm Joshua Hawkins. This is going to be the air brake motor controller. Next slide. The main purpose of the ABC is, as the name implies, control the air brakes. It's going to receive instructions wirelessly and then report back the current motor position. It is also going to be responsible for detecting the rocket separation using a limit switch that is located down at the bottom of the dart. Next slide. This is the hardware block diagram. Um, starting from the top, we have the, our battery, which goes into three power rails. The 12 volt rail is going to go into the uh, NEMA 17 uh, motor controller, or NEMA 17 stepper motor that we'll be using, and the, obviously the motor controller. The 3.3 volt rail is going to go into the, the main microcontroller and all the other sensors on the board. And then the five volt rail is going to go into the rotor encoder and then the limit switches. Uh, on the right hand side, we have all the offboard components. We have the rotor encoder, which is going to be on top of the uh, uh, stepper motor. And uh, we have two limit switches. One will be used for zeroing of the uh, air brakes and the other will be for detecting rocket separation. Next slide. So the software block diagram on the left hand side, the uh, board is going to pretty much gather up all of the sensor data, wrap it into a nice package, and then send it off to the main flight computer. From the top, the uh, board is, pretty much, is going to be running something called the motor position loop, which I'll be talking about more in the next slide. It'll take that information and then send it off to the flight computer. On the bottom, the board will receive the adjustments uh, given from the uh, flight computer and the data logging system and then perform them. Next slide. This is the motor position loop. We start off with, uh, once we start off, we check to see if the uh, zeroing limit switch is depressed. If so, it's going to set the motor position to zero and then report that. If not, it's going to wait for an encoder event to occur. And if it did, it's going to check to see if it pulsed five times. And depending on which direction went first, it's going to increase or decrease the position by one. The reason why it's five times is because five uh, pulses on the encoder is going to equate to uh, one step on the stepper motor. And due to vibrations, it could possibly uh, move, it could possibly pulse one time or two times. Um, okay, next slide. This is the uh, stepper motor we'll be using. This is a, a NEMA 17 bipolar stepper motor that has a built-in 1000 CPR quadrature encoder. The reason why we decided to have a built-in encoder was to make mechanical's life a lot easier when it, so they don't have to implement some sort of uh, encoder themselves onto the actual assembly for the air brakes. Um, this will be running at 12 volts and 1.5 amps, and this should give roughly about 4.1 pound inches of torque. The, uh, the stepper motor is at a stepping degree of 1.8 degrees, and we'll be driving this around 1200 to 2400 RPM. This will give us a full actuation time from basically close to open of eight to 16 milliseconds. Next slide. This is the uh, main microcontroller schematic. We'll be using a, the NRF uh, 52832 microcontroller. We chose this because it's a built-in radio transceiver. So it'll allow for a lot easier integration of wireless communication. We'll be using Bluetooth 5 and we should be able to communicate around one megabyte per second. Uh, next slide. This is the uh, motor controller schematic. We decided to use a uh, DRV8825 stepper motor controller. This will be utilizing the step slash direction format, which will make driving it very simple. Currently, we are using no micro stepping. And because of this, the air brakes will have 50 total positions for the air brakes. Um, next slide. Let's uh, click once. This is the current budget. Um, pretty much the only number that really matters here is the battery life. And it's about roughly 1.2 hours. However, this would be if the uh, motor is being ran continuously, um, which would not necessarily happen on the launch pad. Um, without the uh, motor constantly running, this board can last uh, upwards two days. Next slide. 
this is going to be the testing slide. We're going to try to have a computing performance test, basically to see if it can run a, uh, or the microcontroller can run a downgraded version of the, of the air brake control loop. And we expect it to be able to run something similar to it, but obviously downgraded. And the main goal is to see if it would be faster than the current uh, amount of time it takes from the beginning of the process to a full actuation because there's a lot of uh, basically steps that has to go to until it actually gets there. Um, we have the next uh, slide, the next test, which is the calibration update rate testing. We basically want to see how long it will take from the beginning of the control loop to an actual actuation. We expect this to be within 100 milliseconds and obviously it should open to the exact amount that we request it instead of going over or under a step. Um, and finally, we have a battery life testing. We want to see how long the uh, board will last when the uh, motor is being ran continuously. And we sh hope that this will be about the 1.2 hour uh, estimate that we uh, said from the current budget. Next slide. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. All right. Um, so next up, we have the risk analysis. Um, I'm, go I'm going to present it, uh, the mechanical, and Josh is going to present the electrical. Next slide, please. So right here, as you can see, this is our air brake risk map. So we have majority of our risks in the green area. That's pretty safe. That's uh, around four and uh, six. And then we have uh, one in the 15 area and one in the 10 and um, I mean a couple in the 10 and 8. So pretty good looking risks. Next slide please. So um, in the design phase a potential failure mode for the mechanical side of the air brakes is the flight package blocking the air brakes from deploying and that would cause the average not to be achieved but since that is not like like it's not flight critical, the severity is not too high, and it's pretty easy to mitigate, which is uh, prototyping. The next thing we have is the fiberglass brace interfering with the air brakes. Um, that would make the air brakes unreliable, but once again, since the air brakes are not flight critical, severity is only two. And we do have a secondary fiberglass bulkhead we will be manufacturing, so if the first one interferes, we'll have a backup. And then we have a potential failure mode of the blades moving by themselves. And we actually mitigated that with a limit switch. So that should make sure that does not happen. And uh, the security of that is six, so not too bad. And then uh, another potential failure mode is the blades not deploying due to friction. And uh, hopefully we mitigated that with our um, tolerance analysis and we will also be applying lubricant. Yep, and next slide please. All right, now on to the electrical risks. So the first failure we can have is the failure to receive instructions. This will basically just cause the air brakes not function. They'll be held still and not move throughout the entire uh, rest of the flight. So it has a probability of two, an impact of one, because the air brakes aren't necessarily doing anything and they're not going, they're not necessarily doing anything bad, but obviously they're not doing anything good. So we will overshoot. And so this has a probability of two, an impact of one with a severity of two. Mitigation plan is to have extensive communications testing right when we're about to set everything up onto the launch pad. Next failure is the failure to decode instructions. This may cause unpredictable behavior because the microcontroller is just not sure what to do with the data that's being given to it. This could cause this would be a probability of two, an impact of five, so this will cause a ver severity of ten. This we should be done hope hopefully mitigated early into. Uh, software development where we just added code that ignores any errors or anything that seems extremely or off, for, especially from the, re, the numbers beforehand. Next slide. Now, now we have the failure of improper zeroing of air, the air brakes. Basically what happens is the air brakes will uh, just not zero correctly and it will have its real position be a little bit different than they expected. This isn't too bad as uh, it could be because with how the, it's currently set up, this would mean that the air brakes position would be a little bit greater than what uh, it actually is. And with how the current design of the uh, system itself is, this won't cause too much of an issue. 
However, if the reverse were to happen, this could cause a really big issue because it could potentially cause the air brakes to smash into the uh, the assembly itself and uh, potentially cause some damage. However, that uh, should not happen. It should be they fail uh, ahead of what they're expected to. This has a probability of two, an impact of two with a severity of four. We're going to prob we're going to practice manually zeroing the air brakes and just triple checking everything on the launch pad. Um, we now have a quadrature encoder error. This basically is a when the quadrature encoder will pulse and but no actual movement has been given. This can usually be done due to vibrations in the uh, system to where it thinks to where the uh, rod will twist a little bit, but it act goes back in place and. Uh, this basically what effectively happen is that the uh, motor position loop just doesn't update correctly and it doesn't uh, quite uh, make sense of where the actual uh, motor is in position. This will have a probability of two with a impact of four and a severity of eight. We just need to make sure to add code that adds to make, sh we need to make sure to add code to uh, be checking for the the quadrature encoder to update when the, we give an input to the uh, stepper motor and furthermore ignore any sort of errors where the encoder only pulses once or twice instead of the five times that I mentioned earlier in the air brake motor controller section. Next slide. The next failure would be the failure to detect rocket separation. Basically what this would cause is the air brakes to not start uh, the control loop at all. This will pretty much result in the air brakes just being stuck um, fully closed. So it will just be the issue of will overshoot. However, it won't have any negative effects on the flight performance other than that. So I have a probability of two, an impact of one with a severity of two. A possible mitigation plan for this would be to add a fail safe with the IMU sensor that is going to be on the ACDC. The ACDC is a board that was mentioned in the uh, Critical, the electrical critical design review, it's pretty much the board that has a lot of the uh, sensors that will be going into the air brake calculations. And then the next failure mode would be to falsely detect the rocket separation. This would basically be the air brake control, the air brake control loop starts before the rocket has actually separated, and this could potentially cause some very drastic effects. This has a probability of three, impact of five, and a severity of 10. We need to make sure that the limit switch is secured correctly and so it isn't loose when we're sending it off into the rocket. Next slide. The next potential failure mode would be the would be overcurrent. This is pretty much would just mean that the uh, motor draws more current than what the board is designed for. This could potentially cause damage to the uh, the, bu the boost converter or the uh, motor controller or even the motor itself. Um, this could, obviously if this happens, this could potentially hurt uh, refly potential because the uh, board itself won't necessarily work, uh, won't be able to be uh, ran again if uh, certain components are destroyed. However, th this is very unlikely with a probability of one, an impact of three and a severity of three. Um, this should more than likely get uh, ironed out with the initial testing, and if this does become an issue, we will we may have to consider remaking the board to prevent this. Um, the next failure would be the battery dies. The uh, air brakes are not powered and will become loose. Basically, the air brakes uh, won't, because of how uh, bipolar stepper motors work, when they're powered off, they can be the shafts can be rotated freely. And so effectively the air brakes are not really being held in place, so they could potentially drift off and even even worse, potentially drift outside of the rocket. This has a probability of two, an impact of three with a severity of six. Um, potential mitigation plan would be to add a battery life, uh, add a battery, another battery to increase the, uh, total, the total battery life. And uh, basically just to test the current battery life of the current setup and also potentially to run some sort of uh, control loop, some sort of loop uh, when the rocket isn't launched that just occasionally uh, zeroes the air brakes like every uh, minute or something and then powers it off. Next slide. Um, these are the errors that are more focused a little bit with the uh, control loop. 
The first potential failure would be a gain scheduling, a gain scheduling setup error. This could cause under, over and under shooting or oscillations. This has a probability of two, an impact of four, a severity of eight. Mitigation plan is going to be to filter the outputs to reduce oscillations and obviously a bunch of testing and simulation to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, another failure could be wrong delay values. This could also cause oscillations or inaccuracy because the rocket is moved a lot farther than uh, what we expected it to. And so it's giving the wrong uh, values uh, than what it should be actually be. This get, will have a probability of two, an impact of four with a severity of eight. Um, we need to have extensive measurement and calculation verification on the uh, numbers. Next slide. Okay, now I will quickly go through our budget, budget plan of attack, mechanical design completion, mechanical project descope, and questions. The reason we're not going over electrical is because electrical design is completely finished and they're just worth waiting on being able to purchase to work on their boards. Okay, so here's our budget overview. Our expenses have diminished significantly since competition has changed to online. We did recently find out that we will still have a small fee to attend competition per person. That will be $15 each. So with 31 members and three advisors and faculty coming with us, we will pay $510 for that. That's already been approved. So on April 19th, we will purchase those. Airframe and propulsion is still at about $4,200. Recovery, almost $800. Payload, almost $1,400. And then data and radio frequency are about $700. Power, about $200. And electrical general, which is just shared components and tools, is at about $566. So our total budget for this year, what we plan to spend this year is $9,082.30. This is itemized, so it is literally what we plan to spend because we have a link to all of the things that we desire to purchase once we are able to purchase with the university. Here is our budget plan of attack. Since we are awaiting access to purchasing and university buildings, we will continue research for next year's rocket until we get access to the machine shop and we are able to purchase for electrical to work on their boards and mechanical to start prototyping and then final designs. Our budget is within the fundraised amount in our fundraising accounts, so no new funds were requested from the university and we just need to be allowed to spend the money that we have in that account. The team has an itemized budget, as I previously mentioned. So once purchasing is allowed again, we will present that list and hopefully set a timeline for when we will purchase each of those items. Competition housing was researched before the news came out about competition being online. So we no longer need this housing, but it did range within our budget for that. It was just under $3,000 for the two Airbnbs we'd need and two hotels. Here is the design completion for mechanical. Um, as you can see, most items are complete. The only areas where we are not complete are just things we're waiting on, a few little things to be done with manufacturing or analysis to edit. So the biological experiment obviously needs access to labs in order to completely cement their designs. And in terms of general airframe flight package, deploy deployable fins and air brakes, those times are just dependent on once our more accurate analysis comes out, if we do have to make any adjustments, it should honestly take less time than what we've projected here, um, especially with the air brakes and deployable fins or at least the air brakes, the um, design changes should be very small. And then general airframe is highest because if we have to adjust the open rocket, that'll take a lot more time. And that could be adjusted based on our actual masses once we finish manufacturing. So that could also change. So that leaves us with a critical design completion 
of three hours, which is just that general airframe amount since none of the other pieces are necessary to finish design on. Um, they could be replaced with simpler items. So that leaves us at 99% critical design completion and mechanical design completion overall is at 98% with 10 and a half hours left. This doesn't include the analysis that we need to complete that we previously mentioned. We need to find a server, possibly ask Ann Arbor if we can access their servers so that we can run that without um, just taking over somebody's computer for like a month. <laughs> Here is our manufacturing work breakdown. We estimate that our payload frame will take about 40 hours to complete, um, just in case there are any issues with it. Um, but the manufacturing of each part shouldn't take too long on the CNC. And the payload mounts, we estimate 54 hours. That will just dep depend on print time and if we have to reprint things, because most of those parts are 3D printed. Biological experiment, we estimate seven hours because it's just about bringing all of our materials together and then testing. General airframe, 85 and a half hours. Flight package, 25 hours. Deployable fins, 130 hours. Air brakes, 100 hours. Static fins, 14 hours. Parachutes, 88 hours. Drug mortar tube, 21 hours. And avionics base, 30 hours, which leaves our critical manufacturing total, which are the parts of our rocket that we cannot fly without at 224 and a half hours and our manufacturing total with everything we're working on at 594 hours. Okay, that completes our presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our members for presenting. You guys did great. Um, please respond to our rubric when you leave today so that we can get feedback for our next presentation. And if you would like to ask some questions, please leave your name in the chat and we will go in order. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, Andrew. You're muted. Hey, uh, yeah, I didn't want to jump over anybody else uh, uh, talking on anything. I guess, uh, Matt, did you have any questions? Uh, by the way, hello, Matt. Hi, Andrew. Hey, uh, I, uh, do you I have any you. questions before I <laughs> miss you too, bud? <laughs> uh, uh, do you have any uh, uh, questions you wanted to bring up before I start getting into a list? No, I, I just wanted to ask Justin uh, something about the launch on Saturday, but please go first. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll get into it. Uh, again, I was a little bit of multitasking this time around again. So I wasn't unfortunately able to take as good of notes as I would typically like to, but I have a back of an envelope that I scrawled some stuff on. So slightly better than last time. Um, so uh, hold first up, thing, wait, Andrew, what? Andrew, hold up before oh. you start. Sorry. Um, if you know if there's any questions that will be directed towards me, can you tell? Can you say them first because I'm going to have to go very soon. Ooh man, that's the hardest thing with envelope notes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I mean, most of the stuff you could probably talk on, but I, I don't know if I have anything directly. I, I don't know. It's hard it's to tell. Sorry. Analysis of the mechanical side of air brakes, ask Barnabas. If it's about the design of the air brakes, ask Alia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I guess I have a, a general overall question about uh, scaling and sizing and strategy as far as that goes. So sounds like you right now have a predicted uh, variability in your uh, apogee of about 300 feet, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, what, what weather condition was that ran? Was that ran at low wind or high wind conditions? Um, that is a question for Barnabas. So Barnabas, do you have an answer for that? Actually, that is a question for Sarah, if she's... Sarah, yeah. yes. So, okay, so the um, wind conditions that we ran this particular simulations at was about 15 to 12 miles per hour. 
Um, we did also, uh, I did also run a few in like high, high wind conditions. I mean, we're still performing fairly, fairly well. So yeah, 12 to 15 miles per hour. And oh, I okay, also, I did, I did look up um, like typical wind speeds for where we'd be launching and that seemed to be about the, the place there was at. Yeah, you, you, as a slight side note, uh, I think we've mentioned it before, but if you can get a hold of some of Kelly's past uh, weather condition research by like period of day, that's also very helpful to look at. Um, you can, of course, do it yourself too, but uh, we, we do have some historical data somewhere. But uh, all that to mention is that uh, I was just wondering kind of about uh, uh, how your uh, like Apogee target like kind of scaling is. Because one, I mean, when you get to the higher wind conditions, you're going to be losing more of that adjustability in your apogee due to your air brake system um so that's just something to know and be aware of um of course uh if you're launching up at muskegon you're probably going to be launching at more calm conditions so that's uh you know a positive but just as a note uh uh you know you could easily uh, get over 300 feet of apogee drop between your lower end and higher end wind conditions, especially, you know, depending on how statically stable your rocket is. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there you could. So I, I was just kind of curious about how you were planning on your nominal apogee, kind of like where you were aiming at it, like if the air brakes were off, so you could try to account for, you know, the larger variation in the apogee than your air brakes has the capability to perform? Um, that is a question for Barnabas. <laughs> uh, right. So um, at this time, um, there is the, the problem of uh, motor availability, right? Um, so uh, the motor was picked that uh, the, was pretty much the only motor that served our purposes uh, where we were closest to our apogee. So at this point, we are overshooting a bit. Uh, however, um, we are still uh, looking into um, like the possibility of getting a, a, a motor that's similar, but would meet our, our um, you know, requirements because nothing can be purchased uh, and more motors become uh, available. Uh, so, but the data points we generated were um, uh, based around uh, the curve that uh, we would get um, if we met or apogee um, of a uh, door target apogee of 10,000 feet um, successfully. Does that kind okay. of answer your question? I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, maybe this is less of a question now and more just a statement is it, it'd probably be good to figure out how you are mitigating that, uh, the difference in your apogee with just like wind conditions and stuff, because like I said, like if, if your adjustability by your air brakes is greater than, you know, your variability in your motor performance and weather conditions, then you're great. Cause you know, that's, that's exactly what the great thing is about air brakes is, is it, you know, can work around all those, you know, uh, variabilities. Um, but since you don't have that, uh, uh, which is okay. I mean, it's something that was mentioned, you know, a long time ago. That's just kind of a, a byproduct of having a big, heavy rocket, and you know, you're limited on how big you can make your fins. So that's understandable. Uh, but it's just something to start thinking about about kind of where exactly you know you're going to be aiming this thing. Uh, you know, you could have some adjustability in your launch rod angle to give you a little bit if you're hitting a little bit too high. Uh, you know, you could also look at having slightly rougher surface finishes instead of trying to gloss everything down super nicely. I will mm -hmm. say that I think, uh, I think realistically, um, uh, your surface roughness that you're running in your CFDs, to me, it seems like it'd probably be a, a bit optimistic. I feel like, at least in my experience, uh, it's typically a bit rougher, um, so, I mean, there's some stuff you can play with that, too. But uh, that that's just, you know, a big point I wanted to make is, uh, you know, like seeing how you guys want to adjust, uh, you know, up or down or like how, how to, yeah. you know, work Absolutely. around your limited. Yeah, we were actually just talking about that yesterday. So um, another thing that we're thinking of doing is like adjusting the shape of uh, the camera shots, maybe make them a little draggier. But we're we're still like trying to figure that portion out. So yeah, yeah, we're absolutely paying attention to that. So thank you. Yes. Right. Great. I'm really happy to hear that. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. 
So yeah, and I think that was probably the one that was most closely like aimed for something for Alia. So I, I have other stuff too. All right, cool. Then um, I do have to go, guys. <laughs> it was lovely to hear you all. So uh, I will see you later. Yep, great job, Alia. Good job. Thank you. See you guys. And uh, I don't think there's much many other folks here as far as critiquers. Critiquers? That's a good word. Uh, uh, so, but if there is anybody out there, uh, you know, feel free to jump in between my list of things. Uh, one of my list of things is uh, um, you can uh, purchase or rent uh, uh, Amazon web servers for CFD use um, relatively affordably. Um, so that's an option so that you can get it off of your stuff without having to have dedicated things. You know, you can just rent it. You know, it might cost like, I don't know, depends on how much simulation you're running, but it, it's relatively affordable. So that's an option to, to go with your CFD simulations. Yeah, um, we're going to try to access Ann Arbor's, but if that doesn't work, then we, we'll try to look into that. But obviously purchasing isn't available at the moment. Yep, exactly. But uh, it, it's just an option. You know, it's uh, something I, I don't think any of the old alumni uh, were aware of, you know, just doing like cloud computing for your CFD. I think we would have taken advantage of it if we were aware of it. So just be aware that it is an option. Yeah, we'll, uh, um, we'll have to look at the costs for that because uh, there's the, the compute cluster that Sierra was talking about at Ann Arbor. Um, supposedly it's free for student teams. Uh, I don't know if that extends to Dearborn. I imagine it does. Um, but in the case that it doesn't, I'll have to compare those rates as well. Uh, I don't okay. know yeah. how much hardware we get with Amazon, uh, but uh, U of M should be able to give us enough cores for what we need. Yeah, with Amazon, you just pick what you want. But sure. um, but yeah, no, that, that obviously, yeah, if you can get for free through uh, Ann Arbor, that's great, but I've we've had sometimes some problems getting stuff worked through with Ann Arbor. So just if right. it doesn't, just another avenue. Sure. Thank you. Uh, another very small side note, uh, uh, I guess a question. So your budget uh, uh, request or the uh, budget amount you have listed uh, itemized, uh, are those itemized with taxes and shipping included? Just curious. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I doubt we have shipping included, but um, it's just the itemized amount of what we know that we have to pay at the moment. Okay, okay. So the actual required budget is a, a few percent higher than that. Yeah, for but that's still a lot lower than our previous budget, and it's oh, yeah, within sure. our fundraising amount, which is like over twenty thousand. So we will be for fine. sure. For sure, I wanted. I just wanted to check because I, I think that's something that. Uh, you know, it's something that we have tried in the past yeah. so sometimes and sometimes not. It's like, I was just curious because it sounded like you're specifically pulling things from web pages, which doesn't include. Yeah, so yeah. Our original budget had some leeway for that. But since this is just our literal purchasing list, that's just what we have. Okay. Okay. Like I said, just a minor point. Um, okay. Uh so uh, let's go to, I guess, some CFD stuff. Uh, so uh, I think you were using Comsol, I think, Barnabas? Uh, yes, that's correct. So I, I don't really have any uh, experience in, in Comsol, but um, uh, just a general like CFD thing. Uh, what uh, what uh, solver were you using in your CFD? Were you using like a one equation solver, like the uh, Spalart, whatever it is, or are you going something higher? Um, I believe um, the so uh, well, what I believe what you refer to as solver uh, is RANS. That's what we use. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's a. I, I I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but that that does. I think that is a multi-equation solver, so that's good. Uh, some of the uh, we've had a uh, uh, convergence issues in the past, so we've ran like Spalart, uh, like the one equation stuff, because it's you know, it can be a bit more appropriate. So just as a note, um, I, like I said, I, I'm not as familiar with the solver, so you probably already did this research, but I would just make sure that your solver is appropriate for uh, your particular CFD application because it can really screw your results if you have an inappropriately chosen uh, solver. 
Uh, yeah, um, we, we had some uh, convergence issues with um, uh, in, in some cases, but with the current configuration, um, we found that um, even if our boundary conditions, um, like for example, even if our block wasn't large enough, um, console would just um, uh, adjust those conditions so that uh, there could be a solution found. Hmm, that's very nice. Um, okay, so that's good. Uh, so that's good to know. Um, let me see. Uh, what angle of attack was your rocket positioned at during your CFD simulations? Uh, we only considered zero angle of attack. Okay. A as a note, when you you know move into your uh, you know more hardcore like bulk solving on some server, I would definitely look at uh, figuring out what your like average angle of attack would be through different air uh, air break uh, deployment angles. Um, and then probably trying to run it at that, that'll probably give you slightly better numbers uh, because, you know, you're, you're typically going to be running at some static or like relatively stationary angle of attack as you're flying. I mean, you oscillate around it, but, you know, it's relatively, you know, around some numbers. So that'd be good to uh, make sure you include in possible uh, future solutions. Oh, okay. I was uh, I was under the impression there that uh, zero would be the average in almost all cases. No, it, it, think of it like a javelin. Like someone's throwing a javelin in track and field. Like it doesn't just like rotate in a circle. It's like flying at like a bit of an angle. Like it's not straight on. And it's not flying around in circles. It's a bit of an angle. That's like a stationary angle of attack of like a uh, object with like you know a non fend object. You know that's the center of pressure is all wacky for it. But, uh, you know, the, it, it travels at something because if you were traveling at perfectly zero, that means you're like um, you're stable, uh, but you're uh, well, you're not you're uh, unstable. So like, you know, it's like bouncing like a, a like a like a long rod or something like that. Very small disturbances will kick it off. So it's unlikely for a, a, a typical aerodynamic object to stay like at zero. Right. Yes, uh, I um, uh yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it, there, we could try to use Open Rocket to uh, to find the average. Yep, that's uh, that's what we've done before. Uh, just go look at like the bulk of the flight that we we're running our MATLAB code on. What type of angle attack we have? Now, the tricky thing for you is that you have uh, air brakes opening up, which will modify what that regular angle of attack is. Although that's starting to get into the realm of you know much more difficult stuff to handle. So you might just want to just say that's a level of uh, accuracy we're not achieving right now. We're just going to just hope for the best with the uh, the uh, non-air brake open average. So, but that's just something to be aware of is the air brakes will change that, like that angle of attack number two. Um, Sounds good. I will try to, uh, um, I think Comsol has a, a, an easy way to um, uh, simulate off angle. Um, you know, airflow, uh, so like a, a user-friendly way of achieving that. So I will definitely look into that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's uh, it's a, uh, it shouldn't be too bad. Most like solvers, like uh, or like programs, you should be able to change like the vectors of like the flow. Um, if not, what I've done in Ansys is just like tweak the actual like mesh geometry uh, by the angle of attack. So like I, the way I've done it before is just like a. Uh, I'd make like a bulk part in SolidWorks and I would like tweak the angle in SolidWorks and then I would export that all into ANSYS and it would be at the angle of attack. Of course, it sounds like there's probably a better way, but if there isn't, uh, you know, you can just go through that more labor, labor intensive workflow. Um, cool. Um, let me see. Uh, I think you were telling, you were mentioning in your CFD slides that your CFD simulations are currently being ran uh, like uh, by an altitude like determiner. Is, is that a, right? That was one of the parts I was kind of running back and forth, so I wasn't able to listen as well. Right. So um, the conditions um, that we are simulating are dependent on. Uh, there are a couple of input uh, condition inputs. Uh, so there is pressure, temperature, um, Mach number, and velocity. Um, and uh, this reduces down since pressure and temperature are, are the function of altitude, um, at least as far as uh, open rocket simulates. Um, 
and mass number is the function of um, uh, velocity, and I believe it's uh, uh, air density, which can be calculated from the other values. So anyway, so um, the um, the altitude we picked as a constraint because uh, at a certain altitude we would have a fixed pressure and fixed temperature. Um, so we don't have we so we can reduce the number of values needed because we don't need pressure and temperature combinations that will not occur. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, I just I just feel it just uh, kind of caught my attention a bit because you know based on you know the the weather of the day you know like the upper altitudes are more stationary but you're not flying in the you know really high altitudes where are like really really like steady as far as weather conditions go uh, you know you're still pretty low in the ten thousand foot range so you know you'll still be seeing changes of altitude uh, with your temperature and pressures. Um, so yeah, that, that, that just caught my attention as far as like doing that for your lookup to, to me, at least, uh, this, you know, goes over to like selecting which lookup table you also use for your, uh, control loops. You know, it seems to me like you'll want to have like a way to input like a baseline, like lookup condition where you have a lot of conditions looked up for different temperatures of the day and different air density, or I guess really we're looking at air density is really what we're looking at. But, uh, you know, some way to uh, select that, select that on your launch day. So it, you know, has a, the appropriate lookup table to, to go from. Uh, yes, absolutely. So that's, so that's, uh, that's the um, pick the weather uh, condition uh, part of the, uh, of the simulation. So granted, we haven't, we only considered one weather condition so far, because there are a lot of simulations to run. But with the uh, with Enerbor's server, we plan to simulate different weather conditions um, so that we can pick the one that's closest to uh, the launch conditions. Okay, no, that sounds good. I was just a little weirded out when I was hearing that uh, it was like look up by altitude. Uh, I, I guess I missed the um, other part of that. But uh, no, that's uh, that sounds uh, appropriate way to to handle that. That's good. Uh, so uh, you were looking at the effects of the uh, uh, of the uh, air brakes on the deployable fins, uh, and you were mainly looking at uh, I think pressure, uh, like slices of the pressure contours around the areas. Did you look at the changes of the center of pressure of the vehicle between your different options? Um, we did not. We made the assumption that um, the stability of the fins was uh, dependent on the pressure or the stability of the rock, rocket was dependent uh, only on the pressure of the fins or mostly dependent on the pressure around, around the fins. So that so that's the condition, that's the only condition we considered as far as stability. Okay, so as far as like, you know, checking to see if your air brakes are gonna uh, mess with anything, uh, that's kind of the condition, like the number one thing I would look at uh, with like, you know, cause that's like what's changing your, at least on your static stability would be, uh, you know, the change of center of pressure. So uh, that would be like the, the red flag thing I would look up, you know, I, finding the center of pressure between those air brakes being not deployed and deployed and seeing if there is a much of a change. Uh, you know, what you did, uh, you know, is good. You know, it's informative. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, scaling and things like that can, can be somewhat misleading sometimes. Uh, not to mention that you have a ton of extra, you know, like drag being produced, uh, or not maybe a ton, but extra drag being produced, which is also going to change your center of pressure. So, um, like I said, I think you did, uh, uh, what you did was, uh, good. Um, I think though, it'd be also informative to, to, you know, just calculate the center of pressures between those two meshes and, uh, compare. Yep. Absolutely. That should, uh. That should be possible with a simple console function. So, yep, yep. Uh, that's you know uh, that I feel like I think that's a uh, a pretty standard like uh, output of a simulation is calculating like of a surface or of a volume where its center of pressure is. So I think that should be pretty doable. Um, okay.
Okay, so uh, here is a question about um, uh, uh, test cases to uh, confirm your uh, MATLAB loop uh, to see if it's like working correctly. Um, I I didn't explicitly hear this. Um, you probably mentioned it. And I may have missed it, um, or you know maybe maybe it's just something. But I would make sure you explicitly. Uh, have test cases that you run through your MATLAB solver uh, that your Open Rocket can handle, or essentially, you know, run it through MATLAB but disable your, you know, capabilities of your fen your deployable fence to do anything, uh, and run it for different weather conditions because you want to be able to check to see if your MATLAB code can just like replicate like a pretty decent software's Apogee prediction um, in like flight simulation. So you know, if, if you don't do that, then you really don't know, you know, like if you can even trust like the baseline assumptions and mechanics of your ap Apogee and flight uh, simulation uh, yeah. through Mount Lab. Yeah, we already plan on doing that. Um, that's how I plan on getting the model verified before I even attempt to put any control system integration into it. Um, I already have several, um, several iterations of open rocket runs from Sarah that I'm going to input as the initial conditions and then run through and see if the altitudes match and everything. Just make sure our model is within reasonable uh, closeness to what open rocket predicts. Excellent. Okay. So I just missed it. Um, so that's good. Uh, one thing uh, just to be aware of, I think you guys are uh, using your MATLAB. You're running it as like a point mass simulation, I believe. Currently we are. Yeah. Okay, so just something to be aware of as your wind conditions change by those things that are being passed, then you're going to be seeing significantly higher uh, changes in your Apogee prediction uh, in those cases that both can run. Um, so just just be aware of that. Uh, you know, you may not want to drive yourself crazy with trying to get, uh, you know, the higher uh, wind velocity cases to match because, you know, with a point mass, you're not going to be able to capture it. You know, at very low wind conditions, you know, you'll you'll probably be relatively, you know, within like a like 0.2 or 0.3 percent or something uh, varying. A non-point mass based uh, three degree of freedom model, or I think it's higher six degree of freedom model for uh, Simulink that we're invest that I'm looking into as well. Um, I'm going to consider that for a later revision, but as the first point mass one, I will keep in mind what you said on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, that's the right way to move. Uh, you know, that's you're you're really going to quite significantly by probably an order of magnitude or more increase the the prediction you know capability. So that's good to hear. That's in the pipe. Uh, so that's good. Um, okay. Uh, so how are you guys uh, transitioning between your game schedules right now? Do you are you just going to have like rough blocks where you're transitioning or do you have like interpolation between your uh, game schedules so do you mean like at each individual since um i kind of we're gonna let me rephrase that the lookup table for the since the pid variables come from a table um it would be based off of altitude at the current point so what I'm thinking we would do is we would run it at set points and then we would interpolate to our altitude. So yeah, we would interpolate between and get the exact interpolated value at our altitude that we read in. Okay. So yeah, it, this is at least my understanding of traditional game scheduling. You know, you have like, uh, you know, you, while you're in a like region of operation, you're using one set than another. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it, at least my understanding of that traditional type of game scheduling, you don't have you know, like interpolation like you have. So it's just, um, it's good to hear that, uh, you know, with your setup that you're not going to be having, uh, you know, like the some of the inherent issues you get from uh, gain scheduling kind of like without the interpolation. So that's good. Yeah. Um, so I guess something I, 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 I think I mentioned before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, something to be aware of as far as like uh, lookup values based on altitude. I should have mentioned this when I was talking earlier about this. Um, is that uh, your uh, coefficient of drags change with your uh, you know velocity too? So if you're looking up you know what your uh, you know particular drag values are for particular air brake deployments via altitude. 
without the uh, velocity component too, you'll also not be able, you're not going to be capturing you know uh, a, as accurate of a coefficient of drag as you could. I do. So think, again, that might be um, something you guys talked about, but I missed. Yeah, I do think that's uh, we're simulating um, the range of expected uh, velocities at each altitude. So if there is a difference in that, it should be accounted for. Yep, okay, yep. Cool. we are simulating, uh, um, I think it was uh, five different velocities at a certain altitude uh, centered around the, um, you know, well, not centered around, but like one of those is the, uh, you know, actual velocity predicted by MATLAB at Doppler rocket. And we have a couple of values around it for any changes that might happen. Mm -hmm. So what, what I would maybe suggest is um, just because if there's like, a really big variation and you start falling outside of you know your operating window there uh, I, I would at least maybe think about i, I don't know because i guess if you're too far outside of that window you're probably not going to space today so it's, yeah. i guess it's, yeah, i guess you're you know there's only limited use of trying to simulate those really really off nominal cases so yeah i guess uh, i guess that's uh, appropriate i would just make sure that uh we you know uh we could do like one extreme point and then just use that and interpolate in case there ever is a chance. But I think you're right with the saying that it's, if we have that situation, we're probably not flying at least yeah, flying so in a controlled it, manner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going somewhere, but it's not quite where you'd like. Um, but uh, no, that's, uh, that's good. I would just make sure uh, you put some thought into the spacing with those velocities. Um, just because, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, too loose trying to capture too much data you'll definitely you know you know you might lose some uh some of the detail that you might otherwise would like so i guess that's stuff you're already looking at but just you know to be aware of so that's that's good to hear too yeah we also mm -hmm. that's also relating to the cores question once we have more cores we'll get more points great um okay so uh for your uh testing too I, again i apologize i was uh you know, uh, multitasking, but are you guys doing any uh, hardware in the loop testing with, uh, you know, your physical air brake setup? Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be our last test. Um, yeah. We plan on running it all on hardware. Since obviously we can't fly, I think the plan is to simulate the data coming from the boards, but physically coming from the boards if possible, or we'll uh, model the delays that we would expect. Um, and then we'll read it in through um, a known system beforehand. Okay, cool. Uh, something to, to think about too. I mean, if you have more development time just because of, you know, uh, the delays of competition, uh, something you could think about doing is just, uh, you know, using an external data access system of some kind to verify uh, the response relative to the signal being inputted. Uh, you know, just some external system, uh, whether that be, you know, uh, like a photogrammetric system or something with like a rotary encoder or like a limit switch or just something that you can have external that you can observe a signal being sent to your unit and then observe when the, you know, actuation is completed. You know, it, it, that might be a, a good thing to think about for, yeah, you know, actually smart. validating. Yeah, yeah I think so that's just something make something you get some extra time, so something to consider. Yeah, at least on the electrical like a, side, that would be very easy to do a data. Could do a three D like printed that. capacitive center sensor or something. Yeah, I, even without that, like it for testing the mechanical portions of it, that might be a good idea. But for like, we just want to get like the electrical delays, if nothing else, it would be super easy to set up a simple data logging system where a signal is just sent out over a wire when the like data is received and processed on one end, and when it's transmitted from the other end, we just hook it up to the same system and the delay over wire is practically nothing. So we can kind of discount that. We, we, we do have the, we do have the option to have an external ethernet link. So we could even integrate the entire simulation in a MATLAB and have that all logged and monitored. Yeah, it sounds good. So yeah, I definitely think having an electrical side monitoring of it uh, and also like the mechanical side of it too, like that, that stuff is beautiful. Like moi, like you show that to a judge of competition and you know, that's, that's good stuff. Cause you know, it, that's like really, really good engineering work to like, you know, do all this great background engineering work, like the actual design work, but also put, 
effort into a test rig for validating things and then using that I, to update your numbers. Great I stuff. do think this would be ideal to do because this would also help us better characterize our delays. Yes, that, that's the main thing is yeah. why I was making this is that you want to see like, okay, is it actually, you know, I don't know what your delays are, but is it actually like 20 milliseconds for the spin to move from position A to position B, or is it in reality like 30 or 50? We could so even get a statistical analysis on it just to see if like there's a statistical difference so we can kind of like uh, estimates from that as well. That'd be smart. Yeah, yeah. That's, this is just, a you know, a, like I said, it's up to you guys to do, but anytime you can do like a, a, a really nice, slick testing system like this to, you know, confirm or like characterize your system, you know, judges love it and just good engineering work. So just something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think that's uh, probably a good idea to do that system like that. Cool. Um... Okay, the last note that I have written down here is for the uh, uh, encoder error from vibration. It was something mentioned in the uh, risk analysis that uh, sometimes your encoder can uh, not read the correct value when it's undergoing vibe. Did I uh, hear that correctly? Um, Pretty closely. Basically, qu well, how quadrature encoders work is it has two channels of wires and... Uh, and basically, uh, when it detects any sort of turn, it will pulse on the, each of the channels, one slightly before the other, to determine the direction. Um, I've read that sometimes a, one, a channel may pulse, uh, and it may pulse due to vibrations uh, in the system, more rather than the actual turning of a, a uh, of the actual motor, those or thing it's being a. Uh, uh, I'm trying to be controlled, so that's why I included that. No, it's a very good thing to note. Uh, like, cause just as a note, like a rocket's a very vibe-heavy environment. Uh, you're you're seeing a lot of vibe. Do you happen to know uh, what frequency ranges that that you can see yeah. this mispositioning error? We could definitely um, filter it. I'm not quite sure. To, um, to be honest. Wait, okay. uh, is it the update rate of the encoder of the encoder itself? Is more of what you're asking? Well, I'm I'm just wondering about what frequency of vibe uh, can you start seeing like that positioning error occur? I wouldn't know. So uh, to me, it, to me, it sounds like I think you you nail you might have nailed it there with like the update rate. Because if you're like harmonic with uh, the actual vibe, you know, between the times it updates, it can like move out of position. So, uh, so that could be it or faster. So uh, that might be something, I, I guess it depends on how big of an issue it actually is for it to be like misstepping. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah. If it is a bit of a big issue, uh, then you can maybe start thinking about investing additional resources again. Because, you know, you don't have, you know, competition in the immediate future. You have a little bit more time to maybe think about some of these things. Um, yeah. It, yeah. If you can, you know, we have small vibe tables at the university that, you know, you can work with a professor to, you know, run, uh, you know, this motor with the encoder, uh, you know, through a vibe profile. And you can observe when things start, stop working. Um and then you can see if you wanted to um, see if there's maybe some design mitigations you can do with, uh, you know, like a dampening of the system with like a, uh, like a, maybe like a, you know, rubber washers or, you know, if it's we could do a digital video, maybe approach. you actually figure out a proper yeah. dampening I want, system. I also wonder if uh, we could possibly try to check for like the frequency of which it's turning, because if we set the motor to a certain RPM, the encoder should also give pulses back at set RPM. Um, okay. Yeah. But th that could be another s solution I just thought of. But uh, th thank you for the uh, bringing up the vibration table and stuff. I'll have to look back into that if I ever get a chance to go back to the university or we ever get any of this ordered. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, it's definitely uh, something that's, again, capable to do, but it's also something where it's weighing off of, like, you know, how big of an issue is this if we lose like a half a degree and then it corrects afterwards? Like, am, am I going to die? Am I going to cry after this? Like, probably not. So it, I, I guess it depends on 
how critical that that slip is. If it's like something that can, you know, accumulate over time, then probably a pretty big issue. But um, if not, then you know, probably not worth it. Yeah, I I think I kind of said a little bit earlier. I think like one or two missteps isn't going to cause too much of an impact because currently we're simulating like five different positions of the air brakes. If I go an extra one step, that's only a tenth of a difference between like zero. Per, let's say I'm at uh, twenty and I accidentally messed up. Twenty uh, percent, I accidentally messed up. That's like that'd be twenty-two percent instead of twenty, and we've simulated twenty and forty, so it shouldn't be too much different. Okay, yeah, that's just maybe something for you guys to determine if, like, you know, that is something that you want to investigate further, or if that's something you'll just accept. It's just something I noticed when you said, "Hey, sometimes it doesn't work when it's vibrating," and it's like, "Oh, hey, uh, that could be an issue." Um, so, uh, no, that that sounds good though. Okay. Yeah, I definitely wonder if we can just use a digital filter, uh, like a low-pass filter. Oh, yeah. we'll so real quick, uh, digital filters probably wouldn't help us because you shouldn't really run into issues until it's happening at a high enough frequency where you aren't detecting that it's going back and forth, but rather you think it's going in one direction continuously but faster than it should. That would yeah. you're already aliasing your signal, so that's not going to help you at all. Yeah. But from, from what I'm seeing and what I was expecting just from what I heard with a full quadrature encoder, it shouldn't be that big of a deal as long as things are not vibrating at such a, such a frequency where you think that you're stepping uh, multiple times in the same direction. So let's say you can go clockwise and counterclockwise. If it vibrates in such a way where your encoder detects, I went clockwise like twice in a row instead of clockwise, then back counterclockwise. Because as long as you can detect the direction of travel, it's not really going to matter if you get extra uh, uh, hits on it as long as you get an extra one the other direction immediately following from the vibration as well. Mm -hmm. So basically, you'd have to have it at, I'd, I'd have to do the math. It would either be at higher than the frequency uh, that it's able to check at, or it would be, have to be uh, over half of that frequency. Yeah, and also. Also, another thing currently with how the we have it set up, it would have to pulse uh, five times in the same direction to actually equate to a full step. So yeah, it, but we don't really so care about full steps for what I'm talking about. We're just talking about the error in general. Okay, I was basically just going to say if it doesn't step the five times, we know it hasn't actually moved that position. Yeah, I think we can definitely talk more about uh, how we can minimize that during uh, electrical meetings too later on. Especially cool. once we can actually get more of a physical test. Um, I guess I have one, uh, one last point. Uh, again, like I said, sorry, double multitasking. So it's sometimes hard to pick up on everything. But um, is one of your uh, selectors for your uh, like gain scheduling or you know your selection of your gain schedules? I guess uh, uh, wind conditions, or is it mainly you know just like temperature and pressure of the day? So I haven't gotten that deep into it yet, but I can def I think definitely having multiple depending on wind conditions would be smart. So I think we could definitely add that feature pretty easy. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's extremely smart uh, depending on you know your your wind conditions of the day. You can like I was mentioning earlier, like 300 feet is like nothing in variability. Like 300 feet is you know less than what you'll get from like variability in a motor probably. And it's also, you know, less than what you'd get between like a low and a high wind launch condition. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you don't like account for it at all, it's going to be an issue. But like I mentioned before, too, is that you probably don't want to run into a brick wall too much with this because with a point mass simulation, you're only going to be, you know, climbing uphill farther and further to try to, you know, work with, you know, an inaccurate like model of the system that gets worse with, uh, you know, the higher wind conditions. So, you know, you may want to, like, uh, after you're doing your verification through your MATLAB, like seeing which, you know, what, how your uh, Apogee prediction goes with wind conditions, you know, you can maybe say, okay, if we're greater than, you know, like 20 miles per hour, you know, it's just, it's a lost cause. Like, we're not worrying about it. Like, anything like below that, we, we got it. But above that, the variability in our in our model is too great. 
Yeah. Also, Lucas, real quick, uh, do we even have any way of determining the wind conditions of the rocket during flight anyway? Because I don't know if we do. Uh, no, not during flight, but we can always get the estimates from the ground. That's true. We can do estimates and base it on We that. can set up parameter. Yeah, doing it in the air is not something viable at all. Uh, it's a, it's a very, I, I don't even begin to know how you would begin to do that because you'd have to know like the perfect like aerodynamic conditions of your rocket and then, you know, be able to use that knowledge to understand how, like, where are we in the flight right now of angle of attack and, you know, uh, 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 like what's the attitude to the horizon. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be extremely difficult. So yeah, you really would have to figure that out uh, for your particular system on the ground and then set it. So there are options out there where uh, rocket teams will very rarely, but sometimes they do for really high altitude launches send up uh, like tethered radio songs for uh, slightly higher altitude uh, wind gathering calculations. Um, so, you know, there, there's a, there's ways to do it too, just like, you know, with a tethered radio song with just looking at tension on the line. But yeah, there, there's ways to do that. And, you know, if the, it's better to get your wind conditions slightly off the ground. Uh, again, this is probably getting a bit too much in the weeds for what you'll practically want to do. But as a knowledge, like an idea on theory is, you know, ideally you want to be off the ground a ways when you're taking your wind measurement. I wonder if you could use a drone and have a drone fly up enough and with some wind measuring equipment. Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, that, you know, is probably a, a, you know, like probably you could operate under the same ideas of a radio sign. Uh, you know, if you're looking, if you can know like how much like uh, effort like a drone is exerting to maintain a particular position, and you know good aerodynamic effects. Uh, so you could do something like that if you can have a drone that's like stable enough. Uh, you know, with some equipment attached to it, you can do a uh, anemometer uh, payload on a drone, and if a pay if the you know, you know the drift of the drone, like, and then you can also measure something from like a cup anemometer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can probably get a really good alternative to like a radio sound wind reading. Yeah, Devin does have a drone, so we could ask him about the drone if you guys just, want to. Just note that, uh, uh, you know, it, it is a very high wind condition sometimes, like, uh, probably fine at Muskegon, but uh, if you're flying in, uh, in the desert, uh, you may not have a drone again. Uh, so, just as I a note, there, there were there was... several rockets that released drones, right? Correct. At competition. Correct. Uh, but the thing to consider with that is that uh, you know it's not your you know I don't know how expensive the drone is. I guess in my head, I'm thinking of more expensive drones, but there's like really high wind gusts you can get with really high yeah. dust conditions on the ground. When, when you're like a, a drone deploying payload, you know, you, you generally are like, if you hit bad wind while you're really high up, like it's, you're not hitting the ground. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but that is a good point. But, uh, but yeah, all, all that being said is, yeah, that would be a very interesting infrastructure idea to be able to get wind readings from like you know 100 or 200 feet up um so yeah that'd be good uh but you know you also you know if that is an area that you guys would be interested in pursuing i mean that's all up to you guys you know you, you just like run out there with your thumb and like lick it and be like ah it's probably a very long <laughs> stick yeah a very long stick i like it yeah uh, that's what i was kind of thinking of too i think there are some sort of weather devices that are just really long sticks with like a ball at the end mm -hmm. <laughs> and i was like ah yes <laughs> science sounds like um, the best quality hmm. <laughs> and where yeah. exactly is the uh, launch site in muskegon by the way uh um, wastewater treatment facility so if you launch bad you land in poop and oh i was more worried about the sense that muskegon is a uh the city of right on the lake, right on uh, Lake Michigan. So, uh, depending on how close it is or how the weather wants to fare to us, uh, we could pretend well, if it's very close, which I don't think it is, we could potentially end up being like in a body of water more so than well, like, you would be in a that's body the of 
poopy water. <laughs> You're launching <laughs> right over a poop lake. That happened, yeah. didn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, what was it called? What's the uh, place called? Uh, it's the Muskegon Wastewater Treatment Plant, or maybe facility. Water treatment plant. All right, that's like. Hmm. Yeah, that's... We we've had rockets land in there before, yeah. so that's how I know. Yeah, that's um, like ten miles from Lake Michigan, so that's probably not going to be an issue. But uh, poop water lake might be an issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or the several small ponds that are near nearby. So, so this is where you have to be really, really uptight with your recovery people. To make sure it's really great. All right. That, that, We're uh, surrounding really all the electrical systems in Saran Wrap. <laughs> Not letting any that, water get into this system. It is it is a corrosive place. We don't have to keep going into this, but it is nasty. <laughs> I've spent my fair share of time in that place, and it is hell on earth. Yeah. I'll believe you. Probably going to um, be ideal to wear a mask in that place. But, yeah, back, back in my day, uh, but uh, but yeah, no, uh, no. Overall, uh, I really liked your guys' uh, presentation. Uh, I, I I saw a lot of really good work here. I definitely think uh, just because of the nature of your tackling more complex systems, there's always going to be ever increasing, you know, like things to consider and continue to add on. Well, this stuff is really, really good. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that you guys have uh, progressed to uh, to this current level. I'm really happy to see all the CFD simulations. Um, I will say as a general note, like if this is not a typical year, of course, uh, or last mm -hmm. year, so uh, and you don't have competition in the immediate future, but as a typical note, um, you know, uh, at this point of the year, you probably would be – Probably would have been uh, good to have like uh, you know your MATLAB sims running for Apogee yeah. calculation stuff. Yeah. But like I said, completely understandable, completely excusable. But just as like a note for the future like years, you know, th this would probably be a bit too late uh, on yeah. a regular year. <laughs> yeah, we are but, aware. Yeah. Uh, there were just complications with moving tasks between people. <laughs> yeah, completely, completely understandable. Uh, like I said, no blame or anything there. I'm just bringing it up as a as a general note for yeah. you know like future you know scheduling and figuring. So that's all. I know I know you guys know this, but I feel like it's uh, probably still an important thing to mention as a reviewer. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed this one. Yeah, this well, I always enjoy them. It's not like you're making it sound like I'm glad you enjoyed this one. No, it's great. Uh, it's always uh, always good to see uh, you guys doing cool stuff. So uh, uh, it's good. So uh, uh, yeah, good stuff. Cool. So does anyone else have any questions before Matt has a question for Justin? <laughs> 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 okay, then Matt, you have the floor. Uh, Justin, I was just wondering if you joined NRA or Tripoli. Uh, yes, I did join Tripoli. So did you, when you go there Saturday, you want to um, have the witness form or the level form? Yeah, I saw the so forms you, uh, that they had on their website. Uh, you're talking about the one just, uh, you know, filling all the information of the rocket and then they certify the. Right, yeah. you have to get, you have to get the two signatures. Right. Okay, yeah, make sure you take that with you, all right? Sure. Thank and, you. And um, can you. Sorry, I think you cut out there, Matt. I think you cut out there, Matt. I can't hear you. Anyone else here? Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no. My internet went out. Sure. Um, can you email me if you find out the time it starts? Yeah, I'll probably send them an email uh, tonight. Uh, I looked on their website again during the presentation. I can't find anything. Yeah, um, I couldn't find anything either. Yeah, I just saw that they had that. Uh, they've got a competition special one going uh, on Saturday for getting close to, to two thousand feet. But uh, yeah, I'd wish they'd have more info on their website. But yeah, I'll e I'll email them tonight. All right, I appreciate it. Yep. You guys did a good job. Talk to you later. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night.